people, we don't have to, you know, be very, very specific, right? We can announce our network, and then within our network, we can manage our local routing cable. That's why we have global routing as well as local routing there. So we can get the data to our end devices. Now, if you just want to actually see the reality of these routing cables, now this is a snapshot of the current IPv4 routing table today. Not today, actually, about a few days ago, 16th of October, right? Now, based on this, we have around 481,000 networks or prefixes announced to the global routing table. So almost close to half a million routes, IPv4 networks, announced to the global routing table so that the traffic or the, you know, can be forwarded accordingly, you know, based on what we discussed, right? So you can see, if you see this routing table growth, it has been, you know, kind of exponential time to time. It has been growing over the years, right? Early days, there has been, you know, the growth hasn't been that exponential, that rapid. But later on, you could see the routing table has been growing quite a lot. So one thing what we might need to think about, especially if you are an, you know, operator type, how can we handle this routing table effectively and efficiently, right? Because remember, this is where the routers take the decisions. So if you have lots of entries in the routing table, the routers take time to take decisions. It's just like, you know, think about postman. Today you give 100 letters for them to post, uh, sort. Tomorrow you give them 200 letters. Day after tomorrow you give them 300 letters. So when you give more and more letters to sort, the performance of the postman will go down because he's getting too many letters every day, right? So unless you have few postmen, otherwise it's going to be very hard for us to maintain the same rate. In the same way, when the routing table goes up and up and up day by day, the routers will have a hard time trying to take a decision and forward the packets to appropriate networks, right? So this is why actually it's very important um, for us, especially the operational communities, to think about managing the routing table to a level where we can handle it effectively, right? Now, the same sort of statistics, but in IPv6. So in IPv4, we had about half a million of those entries in the routing table, right? About half a million of those networks announced. Compared in IPv6, we only have around 15,000 to close to about 16,000. So you can see there's a big difference here. 16,000 versus half a million. That's a lot, right? So we have plenty of IPv4 networks around in the world announced comparing to IPv6. But you can see IPv6 networks, the announcements have been increasing rapidly in the recent time, especially, right? So which means organizations now, they get this IPv6 address space and they announce this IPv6 address space to the global routing table, okay? All right, so now, so going further into routing, so we have then interconnected networks that we call these backbones, right? So these networks can be across even countries, regions, subcontinents, or, you know, even the whole world. So there are no real boundaries here we are talking about, right? So if one ISP want to have their network connected all over the world, they can, right? So the same way the traffic passes, same way the routers, they forward the traffic right? It is the same principle. It can flow from one place to another place. So what we have is all physical circuits. They run between those routers, right? Not based on different uh, geographic boundaries here. So internet exchange points. So the, now this is also one of the important internet infrastructures we talk about. Now what do you have here? We have this infrastructure called IXP, or Internet Exchange Point. So what is the purpose of this? Now you can see here in this graphic, there are some ISPs, number of ISPs, or Internet Service Providers. They connect to one point, 
right? So let's see what's the advantage of that. Why, when number of internet service providers, multiple providers, when they connect to one point, what is the advantage? They can share the traffic, right? They can act transit between them, right? So for example, you know, in, in, if, I t if I give you an example here, let's say we have an ISP and that's a customer, right? And then this particular ISP connects to another multiple, you know, there are three providers probably in another country. And in the same way, we have another ISP too. Same, we have a customer, and then this ISP, the other ISP also connects to another upstream provider in a different country. Now, if those two customers want to talk each other, they could be living next door to each other, right? But based on the way they are connected, the hierarchy, the traffic could be going all the way to quite far away, probably you not know, even international, using international bandwidth probably to a different place and come back again just to, you know, probably you're still in the next door, but you still, or your traffic goes part, goes all the way up and then come down, right? So it's not really optimal if you really see the, uh, the, the traffic uh, in terms of, you know, response time, in terms of the, uh, all these latency and so on, right? So that is why if you have this internet exchange point, where ISPs can connect to one point, especially for local tribe traffic, they don't need to do this. They don't need to go all the way to one place and come back again because they can share their traffic between them. So it's much more effective in terms of uh, operations, right? So these are the internet exchange points. Now all those things now can be glued together into this hierarchy of how this global internet looks like in a, in a global view point of view or a high level point of view. So you have global providers, right? And then you could be having some regional providers. So regional providers connect to those global providers. And then there are content providers who provide content, right? Because, you know, without the content, that's, you know, we can't do much. We need to have content. And then, of course, access as well. And then there are things like internet exchanges, so they can sit in the middle so that all those different providers, they can connect to these internet exchange points. And then of course our customers, they can uh, connect to those providers and share this information or get this information. So this is kind of a high level view. Okay, now that's some kind of you know overview about the routing operations. Now let's get to the internet names. Now in the first place, why do we have the internet names? Because we are all humans and we can easily remember names. Now in terms of data communication, as I mentioned to you earlier, we can still talk based on the IP addresses because you know that's the network layer, that's the IP, right? That's the identification. But the names we need because we can easily remember those web servers, the names, and so on, because we are all humans. So it's a way of mapping these names and numbers. That's what we try to do in DNS, or internet names. So DNS is called domain name system. So what we have is all these IP, uh, the names, domain names, and behind the domain names, we have all addresses. Now, when I say addresses, these could be having IPv4 addresses or IPv6 addresses. So in this example, the top one is an IPv4 address, and then the bottom address is an IPv6 address. So all those websites, which I mentioned to you earlier, has got v4 address and v6 address. Now, let's say, now you're sitting there, and your device want to visit a certain website. You're using an application, right? Let's say you want to visit the APNIC website here, www.apnic.net. If you want to visit the website, what you would do is you will seek the help of DNS to find the IP address of this particular web server. You're looking for www.apnic.net. So in other words, you're asking the DNS system to get you the IP address of that web server, which is www.apnic.net. So you ask to put the question to the DNS, and then DNS is supposed to find you the answer. 
the IP address so that your host, your device then can talk to the appropriate web server and then of course you know once you get connected you can download the web page or you can communicate whatever in your know, application right so that's the purpose of DNS system now how we try to achieve this now DNS we need to you know it, it's a system with a proper or you know proper hierarchy it's properly organized in a proper hierarchical structure so you can see it's a kind of tree hierarchy there on the top you have root the DNS root on the top and then we have something called top level domains or TLD for example .net .org .com and so on so you know this because you visit various websites you know you send emails so these things are quite familiar to you nowadays we have over 300 of those top level domains exist and also there are uh, more coming up, uh, what we call GTLD, GTLDs, generic top-level domains, and so on. And then we also have these country code top-level domains, CCTLDs. For example, in Indonesia, we have .id for Indonesia, and so on. And then we have another proper hierarchy beyond that. We have a next-level hierarchy, and to the next level, and so on, until we reach the particular host. Now let's say in this scenario, we have lots of delegations. Now what is a delegation? Delegation is when you are giving part of your responsibility to another party, that's what we call a delegation. So that's what's happening all the way from the root. Root has delegated .net to another party, .org to another party, .com to another party, .id to another party, and so on. And then they look after that space. So they're all namespaces, right? And good thing about this DNS is all they're all distributed, right? It's a distributed system. So you don't have to keep everything in one place or in one server, right? So there's no single point of failure here. And also, we can access this whole DNS system, which is distributed everywhere around. Now, for example, apnic.net, that's a namespace where APNIC maintains. And similarly, if you see, let's say, IGF2013.or.id is another namespace, but they maintain, and so on. So you have very, you know, quite a lot of namespaces scattered around. Now, if you want to, let's say, visit the web server of IGF, in this case, www.IGF2013.or.id, that's a label, actually. Simply, it's a label. But behind that, what, you, what we really need is the IP address, right? Because that's a web server. That web server is running on an IP address. It could be IPv4 address. It could be IPv6 address, right? So when I want to visit that website, what I really need is the IP address of that, right? IP address of this web server. That's what I'm looking for from the DNS system. So how does it really happen? So I'm sitting there with a device. And then I'd want to browse www.igf.or.id, right? Now this query then has to go through all that, remember the tree hierarchy which I just mentioned. We have the root system, we have root servers scattered around the world as well. And then we have those top level domain servers, .org, .net, .com and so on. And then we have in this case .id, that's a CCTLD. And then they have their hierarchy beyond that. We have .id, .or, .id, and so on. Okay? Now, these servers are what we call authoritative servers. So in this case, they're authorized to give answers for their namespace. So if I'm authorized to give answers for my namespace, I can call I'm an authoritative server for that namespace. If I am the if I'm maintaining the name server for apnic.net, I can give authorized answers for apnic.net so on. So if you ask what is www.apnic.net, you can ask me because I run the authoritative name servers for apnic.net. In the same way, now we want www.igf2013.or.id, so we should actually ask this question 
from the authoritative servers of IGF2013.or.id. Right? So we need to find that IP address. So that's the task. So how can we find the IP address? We go and ask, I mean, we don't really think into too much. We just type this, you know, domain name in our URL, this URL in our web uh, browser, that's all, right? But our client machine sends a request to our local DNS server. Now, you are all connected to, let's say, if you are all connected to a wireless network here, we have a DNS server in this network, a local DNS server, which can go and connect to all those root servers and other authoritative servers around the world and find those IP addresses and forward it to the client, right? So the local DNS server is capable of doing that. So now I've asked the question from my local DNS server, get me the IP address of IGF2013 uh, IGF website IP address. Now that query goes to first to the root name servers. There are, as I said, there are a number of root name servers scattered around the world, so it would go uh, probably to the closest root name server. And then from there, root, remember, the job of the root, I told you, they delegate, right? Root has delegated their responsibility to many of the top level name servers, like .com, .net, .id, and so on. And since they have been asked about a certain top level, which is in this case .id, they will refer that query to .id. So our local DNS server then can go and talk to .id and ask the question. And in the same way, .id will then forward it to the next level, which is .or.id and so on. So it goes through number of authoritative servers until we reach the IGF2013.or.id author rotative server, and then that server is capable of giving the authorized answer for the website that we are looking. Right? So we get the IP address, so we means the local DNS, get the IP address, and they, that server will then forward that to the client. Now, this is how the DNS query works. When we just sit there and type that name in the URL or the, in the browser, all this process is really, you know, we don't see this. It's all happened in a very quick way. Even in a few milliseconds it happens. But this is how it happens, right? Now, the local DNS, once it gets, gives the answer, one thing it does, it keeps the answer in the memory, in the cache, because it knows that next time someone else can ask the same question again. One person could browse this website immediately, or maybe after a few minutes, someone else could browse the same website. So in that way, the local DNS doesn't need to go through this whole process again and again, because the answer is in the memory, or what we call in the cache, so that the local DNS can straight away give the answer to the client. So this is how, you know, these are the ways where we can improve the performance of DNS by caches and so on okay so that's simply you know how the DNS queries work and then once we get the IP address the client can straight away connect to the web server and they can download the web page all right so that's the forward DNS or mapping names to IP addresses we also have something called reverse DNS so what is this what's the purpose of reverse DNS now, if I just try to relate back to the real-life scenario again, let's say if someone comes to you and say, I am so-and-so, I live in a particular house. I live in this street address, this house. Can you believe him? Right? That's the question. If someone comes to say, oh, I am so-and-so, I live in that address, you can't believe him. He could be just pretending. He could be just telling some wrong information. Right? So you can't really believe that person. So you might, but if you can get to that house, if you can get to that house and check, is that person really living there? Yeah, so then there is some kind of verification or some kind of check. So in reverse DNS, we try to achieve the same. Because 
if you consider all those DNS query, not every query could be right. Some queries could be fake. Some queries could be bogus, right? So if, if the secured name, you know, if the secured servers, think about, you know, if you're running some secured application, if the secured servers wants to do a check or what we call a reverse check, they need to go through this process called reverse DNS. So in other words, with reverse DNS, what we try to do is we map those IP addresses back to the name. So let's say if I am a kind of secured server, maybe it could be a, um, you know, in a bank, you know, you, you all you have all these uh, transaction type servers, right? So if there's a query coming in from host.isp.net claiming to have IP address, let's say 203 something dot something dot something, right? So the query is coming from host.isp.net claiming to be having the IP address some 203 dot something dot something dot something. But the server will not believe it. Right? Server cannot believe whether, you know, it could be spoofed. So that is why what server would do, check the IP address first. Check the IP address and see whether there is a mapping, IP address mapping to that correct name. If that 203, whatever that IP address, has really got host.isp.net. So it is a reverse check. So that's what we try to achieve in reverse DNS, right? So reverse DNS is something very important, especially you know nowadays when we deal with uh, some of those, uh, especially the security-related aspect. Okay, now let's now go into the internet is issues and challenges. We so far we talked a number of things. We talked about we started with the networks. What is internet? We know it's an interconnected network. The data flow from packet, as packets from one place to another place. How does it flow? We have internet routing, right? So we have routers and we have a routing system that will forward those from one place, from one network to another network based on those routing table entries, right? So then we have these IP addresses as well. And then we, of course, talked about domain names and how the DNS queries resolve and so on. Now, from a challenging point of view, now internet, if you see, you, you have to first understand the internet ecosystem here. Now, this is a sort of a diagram to show the internet ecosystem. Now, you have few rings here. If you see the outer ring, they are what we call enablers. If you go into any, you know, all those details, the type of di different type of organizations, different entities, different bodies, and so on, they handle a very important part of this internet enabler option, right? So you have governments, regulators, they're involved in uh, policies, right? And then uh, you have industry, industry associations, operators, because we need to have operational communities to make sure, you know, operationally it all works. And then we have uh, standard development bodies, because without protocols, without standards, any of these things can't work either. You know, they have to define these standards, IPv4, IPv6, all the standards have to be developed. And then we have uh, name registries. Without names, again, you know, otherwise it, it'll be, uh, it'll, it's not going to work either. We need to have these names. We have number registries, RIRs, regional internet registries, but they need to distribute these IP addresses. So all those different, as large communities, people need to actually join. So all those communities are needed as enablers, right? It's really kind of a multi-stakeholder model here. And then we have providers. It's no point we have all those parties, but if we don't have content, for example, or if we don't have access, if we don't have applications, we need to have these. So we have to have providers who can provide these aspects as well. So that's the middle ring, right? So they are providers. And then it's, again, no point. You have all those things, but if you don't have users, right? So we need to have internet users as well, and that's the core, right? So all these things has to exist in the internet ecosystem, right, to make sure that these things happen in a proper way. So internet resource management is something that we will have to actually focus. So when you 
come to the internet uh, resource management, we have to make sure that we use our internet resources properly, we don't waste those, we conserve, and then we effectively, efficiently use those resources. And then also things like, uh, which I mentioned to you earlier, aggregations, you know, we have to make sure that uh, the routing system can sustain, you know, it doesn't fall through, right? Because if the routing system breaks, it's, it's, we can't really send data from one place to another place. So that is important. Make sure that the routing system is manageable. And then registration. Registration is also very important because these are public resources. And those public resources need to be properly registered and properly uh, managed in a responsible way. That's why all these are very important objectives of internet resource management and has to make fairness and consistency as well. So having a secure internet is the key here, right? So to have a secure internet, there are a number of factors that we need to uh, achieve, confidentiality factor, because if we want to make sure that uh, we can send the information confidentially, that should be possible. Integrity is also another key. If we send something, we have to make sure, you know, the integrity doesn't break, right? In, it's all intact. If you're sending something, if, if something happens or if some, uh, something can be changed, then the integrity is going to be uh, lost there. Availability factor. If something is not available, you know, that's not right. We have to make sure you know, even if something goes down, we still have to have availability. So availability is also a critical aspect concerning security. So security is something that we will have to focus and it is a very important aspect of the internet. So we have been actually, you know, over the years, we have been evolving, right? Talking about these networks, we've been evolving. So we start, you know, we had those LAN or the local area type networks. Then we went to more of online type, you know, contents and so on. Now we are moving towards more of cloud computing and so on. So the paradigm is changing and it is evolving. So we have a challenge here, right? We have a challenge here. We need to face this change. We have to face this evolution. And very soon, we will be having, you know, pretty much around us, everything will be connected to the internet, even in household. I mean, already some, some of these things already happening in some places. Everything around us, even your home appliances, even your, uh, you know, various type of devices in your households, your fridges, microwaves, or even light bulbs, all these types of things can be connected through the internet, right? So everything around us is going to get connected. So this is why, now that, that's the sort of um, paradigm that we are going to actually move into, now already moving. So with this, uh, with this change in mind, so we also have to work together. I think, you know, if you remember those rings, you know, that sort of multi-stakeholder model, we have to work, or everyone has to work in a, uh, uh, in a uh, kind of, you know, partnership so that we can try to achieve all these challenges. I think that's the uh, main message what we wanted to actually deliver during this session. So it's a kind of very uh, fundamental type session. That's what we discussed so far, how internet works and what we try to uh, achieve. And we talked about uh, from you know the networking point of view, we talked about interconnected networks, how the uh, packets transfer from one place to another place. We talked about routing. Uh, IP addresses, domain names, and then of course the challenges, issues, and so on. So that ends my presentation. I think it's uh, pretty much the time. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, take some of the questions, and uh, I will also be around. You know, if you have any questions, if you want to ask during the breaks or so, uh, yeah, feel free to ask. before addresses. About how long is it going to take before we deplete them? And when do we have to transition to Okay. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a very good question. His question was um, IPv4, how long it's going to last and uh, when the transition is going to happen. Now, 
there's no real answer to any of those two questions, right? Now, I showed you some statistics about IPv4. If you, if I go back, actually, to this, uh, all right, here. Yeah. Now, IANA reserved is zero. That's what I, I, I sort of uh, emphasized that point. Now, IANA is the body, I told you, that they keep the central pool. Now, they don't have any of these V4 at the space. So they have distributed, delegated the IPv4 at the space now to the internet registries. So the five internet registries in the world, they have their last few, or I would say even, you know, very small quantity of IPv4 at the space in every of those regional internet registries for that particular region. Right. If I'm talking from Asia Pacific point of view, I mean just for an example, now APNIC is into our last slash eight. Now I use the term here slash eight. Now slash eight, if I tell you in numbers, that's around 16.7 million IP addresses. Right. So we have got a pool around 16.7 million IP addresses. Okay. But if you really see the population here in Asia, right, in Asia Pacific, that's a lot. Right? So you have around two-thirds of the world population in the Asia-Pacific itself. Right? So you're talking here around maybe about 4 billion possibly right? people, and then we only have about 16.7 million IPv4 addresses. So you can clearly say that that's not enough, definitely. You know, when, when people get these, especially you know, there are big mobile operators and so on, so there are lots of these organizations, they need IP addresses. So it is not enough. The last or the few blocks or the last remaining V4 address space, what we have, is not enough. So that's, that's a clear fact, right? So this is why, now, when you ask your question about how long it can last, now, regional internet registries also, they have to, the communities, they have to come up with policies because otherwise, one organization can request the whole amount of those space, right? So if we have 16 million addresses now, what about if tomorrow someone comes with 10 million requests? We can't give that because we still have the whole world or the whole region for us behind here, right? So that is why there's a need for policies. So there is a policy process happening, right? And based on the current policy process, the regional registry, in, in the case of APNIC, we allocate a space of slash 22 from the last or the IPv4 space per organization. So slash 22, when you convert that into addresses, that comes around 1,024 addresses, right? So 1,024 IP addresses, that's it, right, per organization. So once they get from the last space, once they get a 1,024 IP address space, that's it. So that's, that's obviously there's a constraint here, limitation here, right? So whether these big operators, even your organization, can you carry on your business with that 1,000 IP addresses? That's the question. You might find some temporary solutions, maybe using private address space and so on. But long term, you have to have some proper solution. You have to think about the future. That's where the IPv6 comes in, right? IPv6, we have a lot of IP address space. But to ask your question, okay, how long will it take? Again, no answer. It is, a gra it is going to be a gradual process. It's not like something like that Y2K, which happened about, you know, yeah, long time, I mean, about 15 years ago, right? 13 years ago. So it's, we don't have a cutoff date. So it is going to be a gradual process, right? So especially, you know, in the recent times, in the last two to three years, organizations have been taking more, you know, efforts to deploy IPv6 networks because of the limitations we discussed. Right? Because they want to grow, they need to think about their future, they need to expand, they need to have all, you know, they need to think about all those aspects. That's why they've been getting IPv6 address blocks from the registries and they are uh, deploying those. Now, of course, there are limitations. You can't just connect IPv4 host to IPv6. It won't just work because they speak two different languages. IPv4 is one language. IPv6 is another language. They can't speak each other. So we have to have some kind of transition mechanisms 
so that they could understand each other. So there are some technologies exist, there are some mechanisms exist, but you need to uh, you need to actually invest time on those. In, uh, you have to actually have you have to invest knowledge, and so on, right? So that's why uh, it can take time. So it's always good that if you start even now itself. Now you got an over IP6. You should even start now itself and look into more uh, more of IPv6. And what is this IPv6? How can I get to know more about IPv6 and so on? So I would say in the next, you know few years to come, as you could see earlier I showed you the routing table, it is growing, it is growing in an exponential way as well. So every day, day by day, more and more IPv6 networks are getting connected to the internet and they are being announced to the internet. So another, I would say about another 10 years time, you'll have lots of IPv6 networks around. So probably another 10 years time, we don't really need to worry about IPv4 anymore because we have big IPv6 internet, right? So yeah, just to kind of summarize your answers, it is a gradual process, but it's very important that you uh, start working on IPv6 now itself, right? Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, th there is a lot of talk about let's say, governments uh, closing down uh, or surveying the internet, uh, how would that physically work in, in the model that you're speaking about? I mean, how would, where would you physically uh, disconnect what and, and or where would you be surveying what? Yeah, I think this, this can be a probably a you know, big topic where again, you know, I don't think I can just give an answer for that uh, uh, as an individual, but, but again, you know, it is a topic probably you need more discussion uh, in forums like these, you know, IGF and so on. So, uh, but operationally, you know, yeah, you can you can do various things. Operationally, as I showed you before, you know, the data, they flow based on those. If you consider sending data from one place to another place, that's the, operationally, that's the way how it flows. So if you want to uh, stop at certain way or filter, you can do all these kind of things. Even secure security, if you think, you know, maybe someone uh, who could intercept, someone can uh, read your uh, data. Yeah, so there are ways, there are mechanisms you can protect that. There are in things like encryption is there, right? So there are various ways, technological, uh, technically you can do those. And, but again, you know, the decision, the policy level decision makers, uh, decision making, the making, that has to be decided at that level, right? So that's why I think, uh, I believe the, uh, the whole purpose of this type of uh, forum here. And, um, uh, but again, you know, it, it's all, you, you will have to, as an organization, you can have your own policies, how you want, you know, if it is too sensitive, how you, how you want uh, to communicate, how you want to send that data from one place to another place. So you can have your own uh, policies or own own uh, uh, own guidelines how you want to do that. But again, you know, if you're concerned concerning the whole global internet, then that is up to the whole community to discuss and take decision. But technically, yeah, you can do those. You can do filtering. You can do. Uh, you can include things like you know more security mechanisms, encryptions, and so on. There are all possible. Any other questions? All right. Okay, I think, you know, uh, I hope the session was uh, useful. You got some understanding about how internet works. And have a good week ahead. And uh, if you're around, you know, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to talk as well. Thank you very much.